After two days in Lhasa for altitude adjustment, we headed out to the base camp of Everest. But the first stop was Rikaze. The drive is around 270 kilometers, but it took us about five hours to get there because of the speed limit. And there, I saw the weirdest way of limiting speed ever. Rather than giving a speed limit, it shows the minimum time to the next checkpoint. So you will need to remember the time you arrive at a given checkpoint and ensure you don't get to the next checkpoint too early. Sometimes it's limited to one hour, sometimes it's 26 minutes. It's like a rolling math test. If you see cars taking a break right before the checkpoint, yes, you've guessed it. They arrived too early and they obviously don't want a speeding ticket. It's a unique phenomenon on Highway G318. Why? I don't know. The view on the way to Rikazu is special. It's very barren, but the jade-colored river that runs along the side made it look so beautiful in its own way. I've never seen cracked mountains like this. I guess it's from the snow and ice melting and freezing. We encountered a sandstorm that was quite magnificent. Everything afar disappeared in the storm. I thought we were lucky to witness this special phenomena, but it turns out that this happens every afternoon. Geez, what a climate. The peaceful river that accompanied us most of the way, later on I learned that it's actually Yalu Zambu Jiang, one of the highest major rivers in the world. Its lower part in Mutuo area forms the Yalu Zambu Grand Canyon, the deepest canyon in the world. If you ask me to summarize the trip in one word, I think it will be windy. I was talking in many clips, but now that I'm listening to them, I have no idea what I was saying. All I can hear is wind. Only a few are usable for the original soundtrack. So the altitude here is over 5,000 meters. And we're entering the Everest National if I can zoom there. <laughs> Lots of the uh, characters and the letters are already falling off. So, National Reserve. We're almost there. See the snow mountains? I'm just walking to see if there's a washroom. And I better not run. I feel a little bit dizzy here. Oh, I don't feel much bad, like a headache or anything like that. But I do feel if I work a little bit like lift heavy stuff or uh, run, I do feel a little bit dizzy. <laughs> Even though it was late April, toque, scarf, gloves, basically anything that is windproof and warm is recommended. Sunglasses, ultra moisturizing lip balms, and anything that keeps moisture within you is essential too. I actually had a pretty bad nosebleed when going through a security checkpoint. As I handed the identity card to the officer, my nose started to bleed nonstop. I marked the counter well with my DNA. It was very funny. The officer told me that he had nose bleeding almost every day when he first got to Tibet. It finally stopped after a week or two till his body got used to the climate. Luckily, that was my only one for the whole trip. There is a spot on the way to the camp where you can see the full view of Everest and other mountains with the snake-shaped road we were about to be on. It was amazing in person, one of the best views I've ever seen, and photos can really do it justice. Walking there, you can see the. I'm not sure is that Everest or in Chinese we call that Zhu uh, Mu Lama Feng. 
the spelling I saw on the um, uh, on the stones and all those stations, they didn't say Everest. I don't know what Everest really is now. Uh, anyway, they stopped more cars coming in because you can know you probably noticed that uh, there are less and less snows on the top of this the tallest mountain in the world. So they're trying to uh, protect the environment by getting the visitors a little bit further away. And you can see my mom waving. Yes, she's carrying the stuff. We take turns. It's really exhausting here. <laughs> Talk to you when I'm back in the uh, tent. Everest Base Camp is where climbers get ready to challenge Mount Everest. However, the base camp is no longer the real one. They moved the visitors' base camp a few kilometers away from the mountain to reduce pollution and disruption of the environment. So this is the camp we're staying overnight. It's getting cold outside. <laughs> we're putting on more clothes so that we don't get freezing cold. And inside we have... So the inside we have this to warm that up. Hi, it's me again. It's sunset time, so it's... let's see if I can capture that. Uh, yeah, you can see that... Uh, The mountain basically turns a little bit pink, gold, it's really pretty, lots of people are taking pictures of that. I'm fully dressed up, <laughs> I'm laughing because my mom used the uh, uh, sleeping bag so that she doesn't get colder. I'm dressed in this kind of a, uh, geez, my hand is freezing, um, giant jacket and snow, snow pants. It's freezing here. <sighs> Looking back, it was a fun experience. But at that time, it seemed like a huge mistake to me. It was so darn cold. It's the first time I feel so unpleasant to have my head on. A frozen head, and I can't bury it under the blanket because there wasn't enough oxygen. I heard someone in the neighbor tent talking nonstop all night. People say that's also in reaction to altitude. On the way back to Lhasa, we stopped for a Tibetan village for one day. The village had only been open to non-Tibetans for 21 days. It's quite obvious that we were the unwelcomed outsiders by the way they looked and talked about us when we walked around the village. Tsiren Namu, a local, was very nice to show us around her house and shared with us a glimpse of their life. She was the only girl in the village who pursued her studies and went to university in Sichuan province. I finally got to see the tools they used to make yak butter traditionally. However, just like many other Tibetans we've asked, they don't use it anymore. Machine is way more efficient. It must used to take them a long time to make enough yak butter for the whole family every day. <laughs> Though it's fully understandable, I still feel a little bit sad that I didn't find any handmade yak milk tea during the whole trip. So I'm just uh, drinking some fresh milk from the cow here, and um, it tastes so good. It's way richer than that. Three percent of anything that is sold in supermarket in Canada, and it's naturally sweet. It tastes really rich and creamy, real creamy. Even when it's cold, it's so good. It tastes so good. I got a chance to try out uncooked meat, which is a bit scary for me, who doesn't even like medium rare steak. It was a local antelope, butchered and dried. Oh my, it was very potent. It can be a snack or eaten with a meal. 
Tsurenamu said she was not used to cooked meat, just like we're not used to the raw ones. Okay, now I'm gonna use the washroom. I don't know why I want to video this, but it's pretty fun. First, you can enjoy the view. Fully outdoor, and you have a four holes here. And um, yeah, I guess at night if you go here, it must be really cold. Not to mention for poop. Ta-da! It was a unique experience to go further, deeper, and higher into Tibet. The views, the people, and the customs are very different from Lhasa area. I put Ali area in my wish list, hoping to challenge the real extreme next time.